T tell me you're the descendant of Cuban immigrants <laughs> without telling me the descendant of Cuban immigrants. Is this a time that I share my family actually lived off my grandmother's jewelry when they first got here because the Spanish embassy was corrupt and they were willing to actually smuggle jewelry out. And in fact, it turns out they actually shipped it. And so when they got to their apartment in Chicago, there was like this brown bag with all my grandmother's jewelry in it. My, my, my grandmother sewed all of the jewelry into the hem of her dress because they dumped the suitcases out of the airport and took all the shit. That's how you have to do it. Yeah, so epigenetically, your family has either been in that situation of fleeing the country with only the stuff on your back and the diamonds you're carrying, or you're not. And if you haven't, you'll just never understand what that is. Um, that, that's the feeling I always have when I, when I meet wasps. It's like, you've, you've never seen war, destitution, revolution, nothing, nothing bad has ever happened. The Chip Taylor, the third has it for like five generations. Everything has been peaches and cream. And it's just, it's a fundamentally different cognitive viewpoint. Sorry, that, that was a weird tangent, Eric. That was, that was multiple weird, weird tangents. Moment of Zen is brought to you by Riverside. The platform Dan, Antonio, and I use to record all of our podcast episodes with remote guests. Riverside captures exceptional audio and video quality, makes it incredibly easy for us to record conversations with multiple guests and then edit and publish within minutes. If you're hosting a podcast or often getting interviewed, use our code ZEN to get a 20% discount at Riverside FM. The link is in our description box. SecureFrame is the leading all-in-one platform for security and privacy compliance. SecureFrame helps you get SOC 2 audit ready in weeks, not months, and it's used by thousands of companies like AngelList, Coda, and Remote. I believe in the company so much I invested in it, and I recommend it to all my portfolio companies. Sign up for a free demo at secureframe.com and mention Moment of Zen during your demo to get 20% off your first year of SecureFrame. I had an account at SVB, just a small personal account that was like a legacy from, I actually got a mortgage from them in 2018. It's kind of like the, you're working at a venture-backed startup. And so the house we had we had purchased in San Francisco, we had a mortgage to them. So we kind of had some legacy account and you know, there was some de minimis amount of money in there. And so I got a you know text messages starting Thursday morning that were just like, get your money out of SVP. And I kind of my initial reaction is just like this just seems like overblown. And then kind of just thinking a little bit through like mimetic contagion and just starting to see it bubble up in all of these other group chats. So that it was like the DM started first and the group chat started second. It was like, okay, like might as well just move this remaining amount of cash out and just put it in a brokerage account or whatever. And so I did it, no issue, called to confirm the wire. They were pretty pleasant. And I wanna say this was maybe 9.30 a.m. Pacific. And then I saw in the group chats by, I don't know, it was like 1130 or noon, it was like, they're not picking up the phones. Like we have ours are still pending. So it was, it was an insane to just watch in an hour and a half period go from, and I just like to imagine to see the actual time series of all the wires going out. I mean, it ended up being like 40 billion. Um, it, it really was like trickle, trickle, trickle. And, and then the dam just broke. Um, and it was like every single group chat I was in was just completely lit up about people trying to scramble to get out money. We didn't have any corporate money there, which was like, I think the, the more primary concern, but, um, watching it happen in real time in the kind of like dark social is always a weird word. Cause it kind of has like a dark net connotation, but like you were actually watching the, the digital version of a bank run happen. And it, and it really wasn't playing out on Twitter until basically wire like cutoffs were starting to happen. And then people were starting to talk about it on Twitter. Um, and it just, yeah, the other thing that was interesting to watch was just the, the stock price. And I feel like when you have a situation like that, where there's, there's this deep uncertainty about whether or not a company will survive that one of the only, the only metric you can use for are things getting better or are things getting worse is what's the stock doing. And so there must've been this feedback loop where someone you know, they, they see in the group chat, hey, everyone is, you know, their friends are saying, take your money out of SVB. The, they think like, can't, can't be that bad, right? And then you look at the stock and you're like, the stock's down by half in a day. That's not what banks usually do. So maybe it is actually that bad. Yeah. And, and then I, like, obviously all this came out and we, we should talk about this, but it, it's also really interesting is like how fast people start to pick up on like, okay, this hold the maturity thing, like this seems actually like a much bigger issue. Whereas you were, you were talking about, and, and like people were kind of talking about this over the last few months, 
but like kind of didn't register with anyone. It's like, oh, weird, boring banks, like return on equity. Like I, I don't have time to like understand a bank balance sheet or whatever. And then now everyone in a, you know, 72 hour period is, is like honing in on the fact that this whole maturity accounting thing, like there's pretty big ramifications. Uh, and, and now the, you know, the Fed has to potentially deal with us or not potentially has to deal with us. I just assumed that I had to be misunderstanding something. Like it was just unbelievable to me that the bank actually had mark to market losses that totally wiped out its equity at one point last year. And that was the most real thing to me was like last year they were mark to market insolvent. And then at the beginning of this year, they were actually not mark to market insolvent. They had this little sliver of equity, but you could you could easily imagine a scenario where they they get back to mark to market insolvent again and that, you know, mortgage rates just have to tick up very slightly for that to happen. So it's like you know, if it if it were a big deal, wouldn't there have been a bank run at the end of last year? And um, then there wasn't. But it turns out that that is that's kind of when it started. Um, that's apparently when um, USV USV um, there's a Business Insider article about this. They did not specifically say, "Hey, take all your money out of SVB." What they said was, "Be sure you are diversifying across different bank accounts." But the reason for that was that one of the partners had apparently looked at the SVB balance sheet, done the math, and said, "That's not where I want. Um, that's not where I want my money." It's interesting to think about this stuff through the lens of kind of like what came out of Enron and WorldCom, and you got Sarbanes Oxley, and, and like a completely new overhaul in terms of like how public accounting relates to, to public companies. But I, I imagine the, the response from this is, is going to be a, a big fight because I'm, I'm imagining all the companies, whether they're banks or other companies, are not going to have to mark to market things on a more regular basis. But I mean, this has been a meme even just the whole last year in 2022 of like, you know, all of these VC firms that invested in 2021 and, and have just kind of been kicking the can down the road on mark to market. They don't want their companies to change their their evaluations because then that kind of forces their hand. But like I, I just saw, for example, Tiger, you know, some news stories like finally actually taking the the mark to market realization that, you know, whatever, they're down 30 or 40 percent, which probably more if you just look at public stocks. But but the fact that like we live in this world where if you're not uh in a very specific set of assets, you get to kind of willfully ignore like the reality of the daily repricing of what happens in a market and coming from crypto like like there is no version of like oh we're gonna we're gonna reevaluate this later it's like no it's 24 7 365 you're getting mark to market on on everything yeah and the question of when you when you should mark to market is it's a it's a deeper question than just you know mark everything to market or just don't don't actually pay attention to market fluctuations and some of it just comes down to will you be forced to sell? So the argument for why hold to maturity doesn't get marked to market was they are going to hold it to maturity. And if you are buying an asset that's government backed, then you do eventually get 100 cents on the dollar. So all losses are in some sense temporary. And there are other things that don't get marked to market, like your house doesn't get marked to market, your bank doesn't tell you housing, like we check this estimate, you're going to have to put up another ten thousand dollars in margin or we're selling the house out from under you tomorrow morning um that doesn't really doesn't happen doesn't have to happen you can just hold so um that stuff doesn't really get marked to market and yeah it is funny to think of the enron thing because people mark to market has this really negative connotation or had a negative connotation because of enron because what enron was one of the things they were doing was they would do these really long-term deals where the profits from that deal were a function of what you thought natural gas prices would be over the next 20 years. And they could just change their assumptions and magically create a more profitable deal. And that gave them a lot of flexibility for reporting profits and meant that they could do a long-term deal and then recognize a lot of the profits up front and then tweak the deal to recognize more profits up front. So for a while, people didn't like the idea of marking the market, but I think the only thing worse than then uh, doing it is is not doing it when the market actually changes in a meaningful way. Hey, Byrne, good to see you again. Sorry, I sound like a meth head because I'm getting over a terrible cold. And somehow I, I, I'm I not able to talk myself out of these moments of Zen podcast. And also all the reply guys are like, where's Antonio? This is a proof of life. I have not been kidnapped. I'm still alive. Uh, by the way, all this talk of money, I'm glad we have our little communist propaganda up here showing man uh, crucified like Christ on on the dollar bill. It's a It's a good little socialist counterpoint all this talk of uh, financialization. 
Antonio, your spindle outfit today kind of has a little Che vibe to it, right? Like that kind of uh, <laughs> Zelensky. Wartime. Zelensky. Yeah, there Zelensky. You go. yeah, yeah. You, you're not going to wear a suit until the end of the end of the uh, you know spindle uh, acquisition. Uh, when I'm ringing the bell at the Nasdaq, I'll wear a suit. Otherwise, no. There you go. There you go. Dan, if you're if you're open to it, I'd actually like to ask you to introduce why you wanted Burn on, on this topic and uh, and and what we're here to discuss t- today. Yeah, so for the the loyal listeners, they always know we refer to group chats. And, you know, there's a particular group chat that's been going on for a long time, various intellectual interests. And there was like a period, Burn, when did you start your newsletter? I started it in early 2020 and had been writing some stuff on Medium in 2018, 19. Yeah, so basically around 2020-ish, uh, it was like every time Burn posted something, the group chat would get the Burn link and then everyone would talk about it. And then at some point, I forget exactly who in the group, but but basically they were like, we could just have Burn come into the group. And so, you know, you joined the group. And uh, so when we were, you know, discussing who to talk about on this, like it was obviously there had been a, a Burn post that predated it. And and like Burn's newsletter is alpha. So I, I want to give him credit. D- Dan, why don't you do the the two minute explain like I'm five, what happened with, with SVB over the past uh week and then we'll have burn go over his his post leading up to it a few weeks before so i'll just tell from my perspective i wake up a thursday morning i'm getting some dms move your money out of svb kind of seems a little alarmist uh i had a previously had to count there personally with some de minimis amount of money and i kind of was like ah, should i do it i don't know and then all of a sudden the, the group chat started to light up with the same thing and so I, I was kind of watching the the digital meme happen in real time um and then so i ended up you know sending a wire out personally and, you know, fortunately, I didn't have any exposure from a company standpoint. But by I think it was like 1130 or noon, the group chats were all saying, like, no one's picking up at SVB, can't get a wire out, everything's processing. So w- watch what was a, essentially a digitally induced, um, you know, social chat group induced uh, bankrupt, right? Like it was actually upstream of Twitter. Twitter only got it later in, in the day as, as kind of like the wire window closed. And then while that's starting to happen, and people are kind of like, the, the meme that was going around uh, was like Mark safe from SVB, like kind of like what Facebook used to do in, in disaster scenarios. Um, people started sharing things. And of course, there was a burn post that we all should have read a couple months ago. And so I, I feel like we should uh, go to the actual upstream source here. We had all been paying attention to our ghost subscriptions. But, you know, wh- wh- what actually happened? Yeah, sure. So um, I, mean, I think one thing to point out is I, w- I was not the original um, source for this. I actually started looking into it because there was a Financial Times article from a day or two before. And the FT was also talking about how SVB had these large losses and short sellers were looking at it. And the article was just kind of surreal to me because if you did the math on their balance sheet, they so the balance sheet talks has these different categories of assets, like they have cash, they have things that are available for sale, they have health to maturity, et cetera. And in the held to maturity bucket, they had a, a dollar value for the assets, which they're held on the balance sheet. But then they have this side note saying current market value is a different number. And if you take the original value and you subtract the current market value, you get a very large loss. And then if you compare that to their equity, you realize that last year, um, the end of Q3, they had negative equity on a mark to market basis. And that at the beginning of this year, Things had actually gotten a little bit better, but they still had just this tiny sliver of equity left and um, had these huge losses. And at one level, part of what I was trying to write about was like, why isn't this a big deal? Because it seemed like a big deal, but it also seems like if it were a big deal, something would have happened by now. You know, in finance, there's like if something... If you think something is a big deal and then like you think this catalyst is a big deal um, and then the catalyst happens and asset prices don't move, then you you have to ask yourself, like, was it not a big deal? Am I crazy? Am I just missing something? And there is this sense in which, um, you know, banks, it's nice for banks to have equity. It's not strictly necessary. In, in, the, in the free banking era, you could, if you were convincing enough, you could start a bank with no equity at all and just start taking deposits, making loans, like a loan is just a note in someone's account saying, hey, you now have X amount of money. And also you owe us X amount of money. Um, those X's are the same. So the banks are kind of creating money when they when they make those loans. As long as depositors don't say, I need all of my money in cash right now, um, you don't you don't strictly need equity to run a bank. And there have been times where different banking systems have been mark to market insolvent. So 
Japan's banks were pretty much insolvent in the 90s. They made a lot of real estate loans. Those loans were not going to be paid back um, on a reasonable time frame, although they were getting they were getting paid just like if you try to sell the loans, you would definitely not be selling them for 100 cents on the dollar. Um, and a lot of the U.S. banking system had also been insolvent in the late 70s, early 80s, actually for the same reason that they had made these mortgage loans when mortgage rates were low. They were paying significantly more for their deposits. So they had negative carry, like paying more for deposits and they're earning on their loans. And um, the market value of those loans was uh, impaired enough that they did not actually have any equity left. So it happens. That did actually lead to a, a financial crisis of sorts, although in that case, they got bailed out through um, one, more insurance for depositors, familiar, um, and two, they were, their rules were actually loosened so they could make more different kinds of loans. And the idea was basically, we'll let them grow their way out of the problem. And so if they are levered 10 to one and a lot of their loans are bad, well, one way to switch from, uh, one way to reduce the, the percentage of non-performing loans by half is just double the number of loans. And so they were actually allowed to increase their size and make make more loans to other things. So we basically got one SNL crisis in the early 80s, and then the fix for that crisis led to the second SNL crisis in the late 80s, early 90s. We'll see how, how that goes um, from here. But um, yeah, so the, like the, the timeline on, on SVB, um, going, going back a bit, is 2020, 2021, they get this huge influx of deposits because lots of tech companies are raising money. They have to, they put their money somewhere. A lot of it ends up in SVB. Um, SVB talks about how they have had 50% plus market share for venture backed startups in um, in software and life sciences, things like that. So they had a lot of money flowing in and there weren't a lot of great places to put it. Um, so part of their business is they take deposits from startups, they make loans to startups, but if everyone can raise cheap equity capital, then no one really needs to borrow. So they have to put their money somewhere. And um, the one of the other options was just buy extremely safe government backed, either literally government backed or de facto government backed securities and um, just collect, collect the spread between paying nothing on deposits and earning two or 3% or something on mortgage backed securities. So that's what they did. And um, then rates went up. And so the value of those mortgage backed securities went down. Um, and then within the timeline, there's so they. They started actually having deposit outflows last year, and a lot of that was because if your depositors are cash burning companies, you need companies to be constantly raising money or deposits tick down every time someone makes payroll. Another piece was a few funds did start to tell their company, their their um, portfolio companies to either diversify um, into multiple banks or specifically to avoid SVB. And then... In February, so um, FT had their post, had their story. I did my post basically writing about how isn't it interesting that uh, that SVB is in one sense insolvent, but um, has an experience to bank run. And, you know, here's why bank runs are are kind of rare. And here's why I think depositors will be made whole. Um, and the, the reason I thought depositors would be made whole was basically um, one regulators really don't like it when bank depositors are not made whole. And two, a lot of people who work work at companies that bank at SVB or who themselves bank at SVB donate the max every cycle to to politicians. So like, they, they, I figured there'd be a lot of political pressure to to make sure things worked out. And that that seems to seem to have been true. So late February, FT writes their story. I write my my post, um, and actually Moody's, the rating agency, also reached out to SVB and told them that they were planning a double downgrade for SVB's credit rating, and um, asked SVB basically SVB asked for a chance to to fix things up and avoid that. And then the fix they came up with was sell some of their available for sale securities and recognize a loss raise money, raise equity, and um, raise enough equity to more than match the loss. So their their regulatory capital would have been maintained in that scenario. And um, because they did that pretty quickly and didn't have the deal finalized when they announced it, they they basically said, we're, we're raising some money, we'll be issuing stock to do it. And then the stock went way down. Stock went down like 30% that night after they, oh, I think it was Wednesday, Wednesday of last week, um, after hours, they announced it. And then every time the stock goes down after they've already committed to raising a certain dollar value, it means that current investors are getting more diluted 
And so every time the stock goes down, the current investors realize there's even more dilution. So they they tend to get freaked out by that. And then if you hadn't been thinking about SVB, and then on Thursday morning, you realize SVB just lost, they just um, reported losses that wipe out last year's profits, and they're raising money, and they are raising it on very dilutive terms, and the stock is way, way down. Um, you You can start to make some inferences from that, that things are not good. So yeah, over the course of Thursday, had $42 billion in withdrawals. And by the end of that, um, they were they were out of money and the FDIC wound them up. That's basically the timeline. Um, things tend to, um, especially in, in financial crises, like things happen very slowly and then they happen very, very quickly because once one bad thing happens, then every other bad thing starts to happen. Um, correlations go to one and, you know, when... When you run into a, when you run into, in this case, a solvency problem and you start dealing with it, it quickly turns into a liquidity problem because your counterparties care about your, your solvency. And then the less liquidity you have, the more salient the solvency is. So it just kind of feeds on itself until something puts a stop to it. You said a number of interesting things that I think are worth kind of pausing on a little bit. I think one key distinction that the discourse didn't make is between insolvency and illiquidity. Those are different things, right? And I think in the case of SVB, it was kind of both for a while. And it's in, and the reasons why are kind of interesting. I think the Mozart's people, you burn have like probably the smartest like economics blog. I think you and uh, Matt Levine of Bloomberg are probably the best economic writers in the United States. That means the audiences are slightly divergent. So I, I think one thing worth diving into is the magic of fractional reserve banking, right? Which is this thing where I take a dollar and I put it into a bank and then the bank loans out that dollar. Someone gets that dollar. There's now two dollars apparently because of course the person they loaned it to doesn't actually spend that dollar immediately. They then go make another loan. And so now there's $3. And so you actually get the money supply expanding by several factors due to this banking business. And in some sense, it, in that moment, if everyone went to go get their dollar, they would find that in fact, there was only $1. And so all banks are kind of illiquid if every depositor showed up. They're however not insolvent because those loans are presumably good. And so if you mark them to market, i.e. like how many pennies are the dollar are they worth, and if it's a number close to 100 pennies, then you're kind of okay. But those are different things, right? Every bank could be illiquid if everyone showed up asking for their money. However, not every bank is insolvent. And the weird thing with SVB, right? Like what you just said is that they went out to ask for equity. They were, act they were acting like their clients, right? They went into the capital markets and tried to raise cheap equity like I did for Spindle. But like a bank can't do that because if a bank does that, something is broken. A bank raises money by getting deposits, right? By putting deposits. But who are the natural depositors in, in Silicon Valley Bank? It's people who raise venture capital, which has been on the decline precisely because rates have been up and we're entering a recession, right? So they're basically fucked, sorry, to use the technical term, fucked on both sides in that they don't actually have enough depositors because there isn't enough venture capital. And yet companies are spending down their deposits, right? Because they have to make payroll. And on the other hand, in general, their natural client base doesn't accept venture debt, right? Like, most startup companies don't raise, you don't make loans, right? Like the, the classic, you know, it's a good life or whatever, like community banking example is, you know, Joe Bob puts his money in the bank and then they lend the bank to somebody else's house. And that's kind of like the local economy, the thing. But in Silicon Valley, that economy doesn't exist. And so they went long rates basically by buying treasury bills and got crushed when rates went up. And so they're basically screwed on both ends. And that's why they're also insolvent because indeed, if they got mark to market treatment on their loan book, it would show that the equity should be zero, which then caused the illiquidity because everyone panicked because people are too hyper-connected, which, by the way, I think was behind most of this. The fact that, like, at the end of the day, SVPs, depositors who matter, I don't know what the curve looks like, but I'm guessing it's basically like a thousand tech CEOs. And those thousand tech CEOs spend 15 hours a day on Twitter. And the moment one, and they all know each other, and the moment one of them, and they're all funded by, like, you know, 20 VC firms. And once one of them tweets it, it's like a run for the doors faster than everything you've seen in your entire life. Right. And so anyway, I went I went through a lot there, but maybe it's worth pausing on some of those things. Yeah, like I think I think the, the solvency and liquidity thing is is important because um there are a lot of financial crises that are liquidity but not solvency crises. So um solvency is if you sold all your assets and paid all your debts, would you actually have money left over or would you fail to pay some of those debts? And liquidity is if someone asks you for a dollar that you owe them right now. Do you actually have that dollar? Liquidity crises are more common than solvency crises. And um, that's that gets kind of noisy because often if there is a liquidity crisis, then the, the person who owes the money has to liquidate some assets and then they sell them at pretty distressed levels. And so 
Uh, by the time they're done doing that, sometimes the liquidity crisis has turned into a solvency crisis. In this case, it went the other way around. It was um, normally a bank should be should have more assets than liabilities. Um, that's that's a healthy way to run a bank. Um, it's not strictly necessary, but um, is healthy. And um, in this case, they they did not, but they did actually have enough cash on hand to to handle just the the needs of their depositors. Like if someone tried to wire money out in in January, it wasn't like SVB was scrambling. They just they had the cash on hand. It's just if enough people had done that, they they wouldn't have. In this case, they they the reason they got into the liquidity crisis, the reason they literally ran out of cash by by the end of the day Thursday was that people were worried about the solvency. But yeah, these are these are slightly different things. Now, a liquidity crisis is a lot easier for regulators to manage because at least a liquidity crisis in a regulated sector, in a transparent, um, legible sector of the economy, it can be solved by creating additional liquidity, and that always that always produces these terrifying graphs on Fred of you know money supply or Fed balance sheet or whatever. It's always up to the right, and the way to look at those. Uh, especially like the way to look at, say, the increase in money supply during the financial crisis is to say inflation was not running hot in that financial crisis. So that increase in balance sheet, in Fed balance sheet size, or that increase in M2, it's actually a measure of how deflationary the collapse in other parts of the financial system was, such that you net out trillions of dollars of money creation in one place and trillions of dollars of credit destruction in another place. And you get to a CPI that is flat to deflationary in 2009. And that's, you know, it was, it was definitely disinflationary in that period because in 2008, one of the things that slowed down crisis response in the US and Europe was that oil prices had gone up so much that inflation was actually running hot. And it's, um, it's really interesting to go back and read some, read contemporary coverage, like coverage from the summer of 2008, right before the crisis really got rolling. And look at what central banks are talking about because they're talking about inflation. They're they are aware of subprime. They're aware of maybe some some growing issues in interbank lending and some growing issues in um, the the shadow banking system. So people who are borrowing short term have it, they have like a a deposit like liability structure, but they are not banks and not regulated as banks. And the Fed doesn't necessarily know who they are and who their counterparties are. Like those. Those worries were there, but the big question was, how do we keep inflation below 5%? How do we get it back to a 2 to 3% range? Central bank policy is very tough. You, you can generally, you can gen if you only want to solve one specific problem, you can usually solve it, but you will eventually create other problems and have to solve those too. Can I actually ask you to, to explain to our audience, like, uh, I guess the term rehypothecation or just the idea of how monetary policy and fractional reserve banking are actually pretty interlinked in the modern era. Because I think, at least from my point of view, I have a lot of folks in the crypto world, they look at a, a company like Coinbase or what FTX was supposed to be doing, and they kind of don't understand the difference between what a banking license enables you to do and, and fractional reserve as a system versus effectively a custodian where you're actually one-to-one -one holding the value of all the assets and, and you're just kind of being a digital safety deposit box. Yeah, yeah, like that that model is is the basically the oldest form of banking is just you have money, you store it with someone else for safekeeping. But um you do know that there's you know that there's like um not everyone's going to want their deposits all at once and you can potentially earn some money on the money that you've been entrusted with, so you start lending it out in the event that anyone suspects that you won't have the money or just in the event that there is a sudden increase in demand for actual money rather than bank accounts, rather than bank balances, then people take their money out. And if you don't have the money, then you have big problems. Um, what central banking allows is um, it allows there to be a liquidity provider of last resort. And, um, and so if a bank actually just runs out of cash but is otherwise solvent then that that emergency liquidity liquidity provider does step in to ensure that the bank can still pay out depositors can still uh, allow those depositors to transfer to other banks and um, that allows the system to run with a lot more leverage because you, as long as you can trust that central liquidity provider then you know that you still care about solvency but you don't you don't have to care day to day about liquidity like it's it's getting taken care of but um, that creates all kinds of moral hazard, right? Because now if you are a bank, you know that 
You can lever up a ton. You don't necessarily have to think about liquidity because someone else will, will provide it for you. And that create that leads to a lot of credit creation. Like that encourages banks to lend as much as they feel like. And that can eventually be inflationary. That can also mean that they're lending to pretty dumb projects. Like going back to the SNL example, um, savings and loans used to be basically they would take deposits and they would make mortgage loans. That was that was all they did. Very simple, straightforward business. And if you're doing it in one community, which most of them were, um, it's actually the underwriting is not incredibly hard because these are people you see around the neighborhood, you go to church with them, you know them, you know people who know them. Your underwriting process is basically. It, you know, is is Bob a good stand up guy, nice member of the community? If so, he's getting a loan. If not, he's not. And that's that's pretty good at taking care of your credit risk. It's uh, it's not not good at taking care of your interest rate risk. But people don't always think about interest rate risk until um, they realize they're insolvent because of interest rate risk. So uh, kind of, kind of, you know, it, the, the story does make sense that they would they would end up in that position. And so because banks have that wonderful privilege of creating credit, creating money, um, they have certain responsibilities and they, those responsibilities basically change after every crisis. And, um, they, the, they are basically required to keep certain amounts of capital on hand and to not make certain kinds of loans and to stick to different kinds of risks, um, which is, you know, at one level, it's a way to kind of tamp down the the animal spirits of individual bankers who would otherwise treat um, the ability to create money as just a, a way to create lots of money. And um, you, you generally don't want that. It also has this more systemic effect of ensuring that credit creation and the economy is somewhat controlled, that it doesn't just happen, happen at random, and that you don't have these wild fluctuations in money supply where either every bank is lending as fast as it can, or every bank is on the verge of collapse and people are trying to withdraw money in cash so they can put it under their mattress. Kind of, you want, um, if you're going to have a banking system where the banks have a, uh, have a universal basic liquidity provision um, option, then you have to regulate what they do or they will just abuse that option and the results will not be good. I just wanted to insert a joke that kind of illustrates the adverse selection moral hazard problem that like right now, SDB is like the safest bank in the world. <laughs> there is no way the government's going to like let it go. They can do, they can do anything. They can start like literally sprinkling money from rooftops and so much to like various, you know, startups. It doesn't fucking matter. Every, it's going to get backstopped in a second. Just, it's just, it's irrelevant. Yeah. They actually mentioned this in their, in their emails to, to customers. They, they say like, <laughs> if you actually want a, an FDIC insured deposit up to any amount of money, this is where to get it. Incredible. And the other thing you mentioned is the um, interest rate swaps is something most people actually don't think about. But if you actually look at the top like five financial markets in the world, in addition to like somewhat unexpected things like foreign exchange commodities, I mean, there's the bond market, but then there's the int interest rate swap market, which is way, way bigger than equities because we typically don't think about it. It's funny, random self-plug, but uh, Spindle is working with a on-chain interest rate swap DeFi protocol. And I had to explain to the team, like, what the fuck is an interest rate swap? It's like, dude, I know you're not going to believe me, but it's like the second or third biggest market in the world. And actually putting it on chain is actually kind of interesting. Wait, you had to explain to your team, not the interest rates. The history no, no, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just no, no, no. The, no, the, the other team is way smarter than I am about interest rates. Okay, okay. Actually, what's funny to go down a rabbit hole and obviously plug crypto a little bit. There's a lot of crypto protocols that are building like Wall Street style financial products of equivalent complexity on chain. And it's really fascinating how they take like a Black Scholes equity option or an interest rate fix versus floating swap and actually put it on chain against the liquidity pool, which is where they're actually getting the liquidity so that you can take liquidity. It's actually some of the most fascinating financial engineering that I think is happening right now. Um, no, no plug. I have no, no, no money in any of these protocols other than maybe a professional relationship. But it's really interesting to see how a lot of that's going on chain. And, and frankly, I think obviously the world's going to be a lot more transparent when you know. Imagine a world in which you could actually have seen Silicon Valley Bank's books like on chain via some explorer and like understand exactly what their books are like that's clearly probably the wave of the future but probably many many years from now it is although like you could if you wanted to look at their their q3 10q and see that they were marked to market itself so like at one level like the transparency is really really powerful but at another level um people have to know what they're actually looking for and what they're looking at um and it does it does help that there's, you know, there's a market and people can can trade on the basis of just their their independent analysis of whether or not this this institution is going to going to survive and people can 
can tweet and can put things in newsletters and can write articles in the Financial Times. Like there's, there are different levels of, um, there are like different ways to focus people's attention on the the data that matters, even once the data is is actually out there. And um, it is actually now now I'm plugging crypto because crypto assets trade twenty four seven, and because um, there is there is enough market depth that you can you can take fairly substantial positions if you think something is just completely doomed. Um, it does create this this powerful um, this powerful force that tends to check some excesses or at least um it basically creates a creates a nice bug bounty program where if someone is writing a protocol that um, doesn't consider tail risk it's basically free money for someone who structures the right bet against it so um that that kind of you know market marking everything to market and putting everything making sure that there is a liquid market in in everything does does create incentives for that transparency to actually lead to better decisions You've got to weaponize the autism the right way, though, Burn. The problem is that they're, they're, they're actually not looking through the 10Qs anymore. They, they've all moved to Dune. Dune is this like, system for like, writing a SQL query against the blockchain. Like, that, that's where you need to put it. That's where it's going to get found out. And then you create a competitive system where you compete for status to figure out. Imagine if like, all of Wall Street got replaced by Dune. You know what I'm talking about, Dan. Can you imagine? It would be insane, actually, right? Like, you'd be finding all these financial shenanigans like, literally all the time. Some dude would be publishing a, a sub stack, maybe you burn, and there'd be like a Dune query and like, oh yeah, by the way, like the mark to market on this like several billion dollar firm is actually a total lie. And like, you're not going to, you're, you're not going to find that in the 10 Q. I mean, but yeah, eventually. I don't know if it's necessarily desirable. Like in, in some ways there is a nice thing, like you could shut down the banks over the weekend and then be able to come to a resolution before markets open on Monday. Uh, I, I personally think 24-7, 365 with the internet is kind of how people should just have to deal with things. But one interesting thing, if you just think about like the whole FTX, Bruja, like all of the different things, like the the kind of like crypto, a non-Twitter autists who are just like using blockchain explorers to actually see fun movements. And then the other thing that that's kind of obvious, like you can actually see outflows from exchanges. So So in the case of an actual bank run, like it wouldn't have been group chats knowing that 40 billion is moving out of SVB. It would have been actually on chain. And all of a sudden it's like, why are gas fees spiking? Like click, click. Okay, this seems weird. Like everything is flowing out. Now in the case of Coinbase, assuming you believe that they are one-to-one backed and they're not making up their, their audited financials, they, they, they're they going to be able to handle that. It's a, it's a cold storage restore. But in the case of a fractional reserve bank, where to your point, like now you got to liquidate illiquid assets in a fast period of time. And that's actually something I wanted to just also harp on, like for, again, for our audience, I think sometimes people don't understand the illiquidity, liquidity, like what, what actually the discount to like having to sell an asset now in order to fulfill an obligation. Like, I think the average person really doesn't think about that other than maybe their home. Like if you were to ask the average person, like, hey, you own your home, you need to sell it tomorrow. Do you think you're going to be able to sell it for what Zillow says, or like you're going to have to go to We Buy Ugly Homes or Open Door or whatever, whatever version of uh, the liquidity provider that's going to take a big discount to that to actually then go move that asset. Yeah, and liquidity discounts tend to get bigger at exactly the time when you you really need to sell. So like if if there is some circumstance where you have to sell your home tomorrow, it's probably a circumstance where other people do too. And maybe We Buy Ugly Houses has exhausted their credit line. And so yeah, you get, you get an even lower bid. I think one of the strongest illustrations of that is actually the um, the very brief industry that sprung up in trading SVB claims over the weekend after it collapsed, and um, apparently hedge funds and investment banks were bidding at like sixty five, seventy cents on the dollar for these claims, and it turned out um, I don't know if any of those deals actually went through. I feel like the hedge fund deals probably do go through, and then the the investment bank deals they know that. They will never underwrite another tech IPO again if they bought someone's SVB claims at 65 cents on the dollar and those claims were a government obligation worth 100 cents on the dollar um, 12 hours later. So it's going to be it's going to be hard to get your name onto the S1 if uh, if your firm did that. But um, that that does illustrate just how quickly how how big the illiquidity discount can be. And that's for a cat like asset. Like it's very easy to evaluate that. And um, people put together, in fact, um, the same investment bank that was bidding most aggressively on the claims, someone else at the bank actually put together a an analysis of what uninsured deposits, what kind of return uninsured deposits would get if everything gets liquidated under pretty conservative scenarios where, you know, the MBS and treasuries get liquidated at pretty much the market price. Um, 
loans to startups and loans to to vineyards and things because that was um it was a billion dollar chunk of the svb balance sheet um maybe those get liquidated at at some discount but you know someone someone will want to buy them um especially at a discount so like even even in that scenario i think they got to that depositors would get back 98 cents on the dollar but um having a claim that will probably pay off at 98 cents on the dollar at some unknown time in the next couple of years is very different from having a checking account that has 100 cents on the dollar. And that's actually like, that is part of what happens in a crisis. Like things that were money turn into not money. And that's why everyone's freaked out. And that's why the money supply, like the, the real money supply, like the supply of spendable money collapses massively in a crisis because the money supply consisted of the things that you could turn into money very easily. And suddenly a lot of those things you can't turn into money anymore. So, so just to clarify Dan's question, there, were, there was hedge funds bidding on your deposit at SVB to startup founders. So if you had like $10 million locked up in SVB, some hedge fund fucking snake shows up and says, you know what, I'll pay you $6 million for that $10 million claim. I, I don't know if anyone actually took those deals, but imagine what it feels like 48 hours later, fucking yelling gets on the phone and says, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're backstopping the whole thing. And you literally just gave 40% of your net away to some fucking hedge fund snake. How do you explain that? How do you explain that exactly to your investors uh, that you got money up? As another plug for crypto, by the way, I had some money locked up in Coinbase, actually, although I, I'm bullish Coinbase in general. And I was like, okay, total panic fucking mode. How do, what's the fastest way to get money out of, out of Coinbase? Dan, what's the fastest way to get money out of Coinbase? Also, the USDC was depegging, speaking of... Yeah, was, so what I was actually going to say is we got a real time market on actually the people buying claims on a on an asset, right? So one to one backing for USDC. Circle says, "Hey, we have three point three billion. They're slow to get that out." Saturday, I think it dropped down to eighty something cents on the dollar. And so if you didn't even have to do this like weird deal where you found someone to sell you a deposit. If you just wanted to take the bet that the Fed is going to come in on Monday and, and backstop SVB. You made twelve percent, and and it, on crypto, you could go leverage the shit out of that, right? So you, I, I would be surprised if someone made a ton of money just thinking like, okay, they're not going to let this bank fail. The, the market converged to, to true book value instantly because it was like three billion dollars on like forty-two billion dollars of market cap. So whatever that is, roughly seven point five percent, it fucking pinned to ninety-two point five like instantly as soon as the need came out. And then as soon as like, oh, Silicon Valley is going to have like ninety percent recovery, it was 0.9 times seven percent. Oop. Up to 98, 99, we go like instantly. Like the math was that simple. It's incredible. The, the one other thing I would say um, for people who, to Burns' point, which I think is really spot on, is when you want to sell something you think is liquid, there's probably a lot of other people who want to sell it. So whatever the price that you thought you were going to be able to, even at the discount, is probably even, it's a cascading spiral, is um, the movie Margin Call, which I think is the best film about the financial crisis, like in terms of uh, top tier acting, and then just that scene in the boardroom, just to watch like how they're processing, like what we need to do the next day. I mean, I, I, I've probably seen that movie 10 times. It's just like so amazing. But, but the one other thing I would mention, so I, I'm a complete finance noob in all this world. But when I was at Coinbase, we launched a, uh, an exchange, like, a, like an actual like advanced trading platform, not the, the simple buy, buy crypto on, on coinbase.com. And I had no idea what a central limit order book was. And I, I think the average person doesn't even really understand that. But like once you you can see what the market looks like and that there's a shape to it and that if you have X amount of asset, whatever the market is on the you want to go sell and then you can actually look at what the demand for buying is and, and realize like you could eat through the order book pretty fast and then there's no backstop. Like you really start to appreciate like what liquidity and the actual value of an asset at a given time is really just the the aggregate number of people willing to buy that asset from you at that time. Otherwise, it's basically worth nothing. We we used to say I used to work on a Wall Street trading floor. There's no hedge against liquidity. You can't force someone to trade with you, right? You can hedge against all sorts of market parameters, but if the market disappears, well, unless you're a dictator, you can't put a gun to somebody's head and say trade with me. It just goes away. C can I share one last weekend war story since we're like sharing? random weekend war, war stories about the fucking panic in which everyone was thinking the world's about to end. So I had to get, I had to get money out of my centralized exchange because I felt like fiduciary duty as a CEO, whatever. And the fastest way was obviously Bitcoin. So I, I swapped the U as soon as I started unpegging USDC to USD and then USD to Bitcoin, right? And then I'm like, where do I send it to, <laughs> right? And of course I had a hardware wallet, right? Like super fucking degen, one of these ledger hardware wallets. And so like I took... Some of our investors paid us in crypto. So we took the money in crypto and more or less left it there. So I'm like, okay, not that we're like super long crypto. We just left it in crypto. But I'm like, what the fuck do we do? 
Um, because some of the banks involved in crypto, such as Signature, for example, got nuked that weekend. And so I didn't know where the dollar deposit was being held, right? So I'm like, screw it. Ready for Bitcoin immediately. I wired it to myself, which is weird, but whatever, into my little hard wallet. And uh, you know, walking around the weekend with the world blowing up with like better part of a million dollars like in my pocket, like, oh yeah, this is fucking totally normal. <laughs> Just walking around in our wallet with all this money on this thing. By the way, I also, now that we're dealing with hard wallets, um, I'm going to make a crude joke, but I, I've been known for making those. Um, there's uh, Ledger also sent me this little case. Do you know about this, Dan? There's like their little anti-nuclear case that you can put the fucking wallet in. And so you can take your little wallet, you know, your wallet that has like millions of dollars on it. You stick it in here. You screw it up like this. And this reminds me, have you guys seen the classic Steve McQueen, Dustin Hoffman film, Papillon? Classic. Classic. It's, it's actually a book by a writer named Henri Chaucher. And he wrote a book called Papillon. He was an inmate in Devil's Island. And um, it, was, it, it did not win the Prix Goncourt, I have to say. Uh, that was a very popular book at the time. I think it came out before the Prix Goncourt was a thing. Um, the inmates, in order, how do they, econom the, in, the economics of jails are, are fascinating. As you know, Bern, there's like a number of economic papers. Or what's the famous one about the prison camp in Europe and like the, the exchange rate of cigarettes or something? It came out in like 1945 or six. It was written by a British economist who was in a German POW camp. Anyhow, the way they would actually keep value is in a thing called the plan, which was a little screw top tube like this that they would put where the sun doesn't shine. And that's how they would carry money around. And so, anyhow, I just think of my little Bitcoin wallet and, and somehow that comes to mind. T tell me you're the descendant of Cuban immigrants <laughs> without telling me the descendant of Cuban immigrants. Is this a time that I share my family I actually lived off my grandmother's jewelry when they first got here because the Spanish embassy was corrupt and they were willing to actually smuggle jewelry out. And in fact, it turns out they actually shipped it. And so when they got to their apartment in Chicago, there was like this brown bag with all my grandmother's jewelry in it. My, my, my grandmother sewed all of the jewelry into the hem of her dress because they dumped the suitcases out of the airport and took all the shit. That's how you have to do it. Yeah. So epigenetically, your family has either been in that situation of fleeing the country with only the stuff on your back and the diamonds you're carrying, or you're not. And if you haven't, you'll just never understand what that is. Um, that, that's the feeling I always have when I, when I meet wasps. It's like you've You've never seen war, destitution, revolution. Nothing, nothing bad has ever happened that Chip Taylor III has it. For like five generations, everything's been peaches and cream. And it's just, it's a fundamentally different cognitive viewpoint. Sorry, that, that was a weird tangent, Eric. That was, that was multiple weird, weird tangents. I will note on the prison thing, um, and speaking of things be, that used to be money that stopped being money, um, there's actually a Wall Street Journal article from a while back that um, because so many prisons have banned cigarettes, cigarettes actually got demonetized. They are no longer the medium of exchange. And the new one is um, packets of mackerel because it's easy to count them and you can just eat them for, for protein if you work out a lot. So there's like, a, there's like this baseline demand. Um, commodity money usually doesn't work especially well because you create too much demand for the commodity and people hoard it and then they, they produce too much and then the bubble pops. But in this case, I guess the economy is simple enough that um that it still works out but yeah there's um even even in prisons you sometimes run into financial crises where the money you thought you had um you either don't have it or you have it but it's not money or you have it and it's money but you can't move it so this burn reminds me like and it's always hard if you're talking crypto people like the, the idea that you would even be supporting the way the fiat system works but I think if you, and I hate the term steel man, but, but like the, the argument for fiat money as, as constructed is that it is actually the greatest enabler of credit. Would you like, and credit is actually the, the, the biggest single financial innovation that the West has really pushed on the rest of the world. And it's, it's, it's fueled all the growth and it has downsides, but, but like fractional reserve banking and the Fed are, are like intimately interwoven with credit and, and credit is what makes our modern society in, in the West work. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's true. And I think that you, you could have this, this fairly hardcore, like Austrian economics view that or Austrian influence view that any kind of like fractional reserve banking is a scam and that credit creation is fraud. But um, there are plenty of real world things that do actually analogize to that pretty well. Um, like I think of, if you think of someone who's working at a company and so they have these various commitments they've made, they're running a maturity mismatch book where they say like, I will get this project done by the end of this week. And they don't really know how much is going to come up between now and when the project is supposed to get done. So they are making this fixed promise that is a large denomination promise on the basis that 
they will be able to um, continuously source like time liquidity and be able to use that to service the debt. And sometimes those debts do just blow up and have to get restructured. They have to say the product is behind or they have to do a distressed borrow, like push something else off or get someone else to help them or something like a lot of the world. If the world of promises is just full of fractional reserve, it's full of maturity mismatches and um, full of credit risk. And we all kind of we all kind of get by. Um, and if you're going to have a system, like if you're going to have just a, a species where we operate that way, because reality does not allow us to always perfectly hedge all of our risks, then um, it can make sense to do it in a formal, invisible way where we actually know we know that that's what we're doing and we know how it blows up. And then we have the whole playbook for what to do when it blows up. And we also know that the rules are always approaching perfection by fixing whatever went wrong in the last crisis. And then um, that tends to create the next crisis, but hopefully the next crisis is not quite as bad. Like um, I, I was thinking about this with, with the banks. So in the mid 2000s, they were all paying fines for things that they did that enabled irresponsible speculation in equities. And at the same time, they were also doing things that enabled irresponsible speculation in credit. And then post-crisis, we, we basically we significantly reduced the amount of credit risk that banks can take, but they can still take duration risk. They can still take rates risk. So we're always one step behind because banks try to make money. Companies like to take risks. And whenever you eliminate one category of risks, you make the next category relatively more attractive. And there's really, there's really no end to it. Like banking is, it's fundamentally, there, there is fundamental risk in running an organization that has leverage and that offers demand deposits. Um, no way getting around that. And the world just, the world has demand for, um, fixed assets that have a very long useful life and where the, the optimal way to finance that is with long-term debt. Um, by that, I mostly mean housing, like the world needs housing. And um, the world also has demand on the saver side for demand accounts, like a, a checking account where you have your money, you can take it out whenever you want to. So the world just runs a maturity mismatch book. And if we, if we didn't adjust for that, we would have much, much higher long-term interest rates and probably um, persistently low or zero, like negative real rates on demand deposits. And we've uh, like the fiat system is actually this surprisingly successful way to engineer a kind of sensible yield curve on average where houses do get financed and you can have a checking account and you don't have to put all of your money in laddered CDs that pay off in five to 25 years and your your mortgage is a 30 year mortgage you pay down over time. Whereas before, before banks were really into um, financing housing, a typical mortgage would be 50% down five years. And there's a balloon payment at the five year term balloon payment at the end. So very few people could buy them because almost no financial institution actually wanted to lock up money um, in a fixed income product for as long as uh, like for, for a time period that matched the useful life of a house. So they didn't. Um, you had insurance companies would do it, and wealthy people would invest in mortgages. But the banking system mostly didn't. In fact, um, there's a there's a really good book called The Dead Pledge um, that I recommend all the time because it's it's basically a long history of how we got the banking system to start making mortgage loans, and then how this repeatedly blew up the banking system just over and over again. And it had to be rebuilt, redesigned, and um, new rules had to be set up. Like it kept on happening. But um, it did actually allow, it did actually shift a lot of that capital towards housing. And housing is a, a massive asset class. And um, it's, it's an asset class where you, you need a house once you move out from where, you know, once, once you move out from your parents' home, you need a house. And um, if you did not get a house until you could save up enough money to um, actually buy one for cash, then we would all generally live in smaller houses and um, our parents would be, would be pretty sick of us uh, by the time, by the time we finally saved up enough to get out. So it is in that sense, pretty, pretty pro-social, but then that ends up being downstream of, of other problems. Like um, we would not need to have a multi-trillion dollar mortgage market, um, or we wouldn't need to have quite as large a mortgage market if the supply of housing were more elastic. So um, you can, 
you know, it's uh, maybe it's like this, this Yimby maximalist mindset to say that actually the way that we solve financial crises is to build more houses. But um, there's, there's pretty good evidence that the, the engineered shortage in housing is a substantial contributor to that maturity mismatch problem. So it's a substantial contributor to financial crises. I'm going to take the other side of this, burn. I'm going to say, if we didn't have this mortgage market, it, it wouldn't be the case that everything would be terrible. We would just be Europeans. That's how Europe usually works. They don't actually have the same mortgage market we do. And like in Germany, for example, I think it's also cultural. They're just like cheap and they just like save up and pay for a house cash. And in the United States, it's actually fairly rare. And, and or they stay living with their parents until they're, you know, 40, which is what you see in Italy um, but or in Spain. But on the whole, though, right, like everyone knows that famous chart, which everyone uses to justify bull most cost disease or whatever, in which you see these skyrocketing costs of everything. I have to believe that part of the skyrocketing cost of the United States is due to this massively sophisticated and levered mortgage market where like literally a bank, a banker will let you lever up four to one on your income to buy a house. Like it has to be the case that average housing costs in San Francisco is higher because of that. And in the counterfactual where that doesn't exist, uh, we would not be paying $1,000 a square foot for a condo. Don't ask me why I know these numbers off the top of my head, but that that's that's the reality. No, I, I do think that's true, and um, I, so I I've been writing about how the the mortgage market is is kind of broken and housing is a stupid investment. But then I did end up buying a house um, early last year, uh -huh. and yeah, I know it sucks. <laughs> Although it, it was actually a fantastic trade because I took out a mortgage, so um, I took out this large short rates bet where I can't get margin called. I actually seriously considered hedging my rates exposure with treasury futures. Um, and I'm very glad I didn't because I went short rates in February of 2021. And it's actually like my best trade and in a long time. So um, yeah, I did, I did end up doing that. But that process was so weird, because um, they, they offer you a lot of house um, for uh, given given your income. And I felt like they were really really suggesting a, a fairly irresponsible amount of leverage. Um, and at some level, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, but I, uh, um, I, w I was taken aback by how much house, how much house you can get for given income and how much, uh, how, how, how much faith they had in my ability to keep getting subscriptions to my newsletter and, uh, continue servicing that mortgage. So we, we bought a lot less house than, than they, uh, than, than we could have. Um, in part, just didn't need it. And in part, um, yeah, it, it seemed like a kind of disturbing amount of leverage. So, Bert, but hold on, hold on. Didn't you, didn't you, didn't you used to work for Steve Cohen at a hedge fund? I did. Yes. Wouldn't he have told you to like totally load the boat and buy the biggest fucking house in Austin you could possibly buy? The hedge fund, like they, they definitely like it if you can make an asymmetric bet, but they also, their, their specialty is more on the bets that you can get out of very, very fast when you're wrong. and. Um, and there's like, I actually think that that's, that's a useful mindset to be like fully invested at all times or like as fully invested as you can be most of the time and to be very confident in your views, do a lot of work. And then as soon as prices start moving in a surprising direction, think to yourself, there's a very good chance that I'm wrong. Like if I were right, I would be making money right now. I'm losing money right now. So obviously someone smarter than me was on the other side of my trade. I'm going to get out and then I'm going to be the smart person who is not long this thing that is going to zero. And then um, then I'll I'll think about what I did wrong and feel very bad about myself and make a better trade next time. And it's it's uh, you can't really do that in housing, unfortunately. Um, maybe crypto fixes this. Maybe maybe I will be able to day trade fractional unit like tokenized units of my house every single day, 24-7, 365. Um, but yeah, for now, for now, housing is just um, not great for not great for someone who likes to have fairly tight stop loss orders. We mentioned, for example, launching interest rate swaps on on chain. It's this protocol called Volts, whatever, and and it's it's interesting. I was going through your documentation. It's a very well designed product. I'm curious how much how much of the financial world as we know it today, everything from oil futures to you know mortgage loans, which get bundled into CDOs and and mortgage backed securities. How much of that is like historically contingent artifact of the way banking developed, uh, you know, Amsterdam stopped trading, uh, the sycamore tree that, you know, started Wall Street and where people would trade revolution. How much of that is that? And how much is crypto a chance to reboot that with like a totally different history? 
and build a different financial system. Like for so, for example, bonds are some of the oldest damn things in the world. Those like Mesopotamian tablets with with, with debts that effectively amount to bonds. And bond trading is still one of the biggest markets in the world. You don't see bonds in crypto, right? You you see you see lending. There's lending and staking, right? On the other side of every sort of derivatives market, there's somebody who just wants like a 10% return, who's the capital on the other side of every trade, right? But you don't see bonds. And there's, there's, there's a lot of things that, that do exist in different form in crypto and a lot of things that don't. So I'm curious if you think that crypto is going to make us go in some wholly different direction. And if so, what that direction might look like. So I would say that a lot of financial instruments have co-evolved with legal systems over a very long times, uh, over a very long time, and that um, a legal system in crypto terms is just a really, really good oracle, and it's an oracle that has gone through a lot of tests and has sort of converged on the right thing. Or really, you know, you have you have multiple oracles because you can do business in different jurisdictions, and generally, the the jurisdictions that had rules that were internally consistent and made sense for both sides were the ones that did um, that were that had the competitive advantage for international trade. And you know, there's there's definitely a tight correlation historically between being a city where lots of ships from all over the world come in and unload goods and load up other goods and then being a financial center. So you have Amsterdam and then later on you had London. Um, you know, there there are other other financial centers that are not on the water, but it's uh it's kind of hard to find them. You you do have that that connection. And um I so I think a lot of it is just it is actually better thought out than you would think. And it's surprising how far back some of the precedents go for, for some of these kind of sensible rules for what to do when someone defaults on debt or what to do when um, there's a, a disagreement about the term of um, the term of some agreement or whatever. Um, so like a lot of that stuff, you, when you rebuild it in crypto, you just, you end up having, you will, you will end up um, if you do your research afterwards, having just, immense respect for some 17th century Dutch jurist who actually figured out how to how to handle this kind of edge case long before you did. Now, that is so that's one reason that I would I would expect um, the fiat system to still have an advantage in in some standardized securities for a very, very long time. Um, and, and for financial products, um, a lot of other financial products, too. But then I think the case where crypto gets really interesting is with composable financial products. So as you know, there are exotic derivative desks where they will be able to sell you any kind of weird prop bet you want to make on any kind of odd confluence of events, market prices. You know, if you if you truly need a bet that pays off if the yen does X and volatility on the NASDAQ does Y, while oil does not do Z, um, someone will be able to make that bet and um, they will probably make a lot of money taking the other side from you and hedging it out. But um, crypto can build those composable contracts just like as as their own contract. You don't you don't quite need a market maker like you can you can basically construct the the hedge that the market maker would make on your own. So I think it can be good for that. And then then you run into the problem of um, you need things to bet on where there is a trustworthy, mutually trustworthy oracle, and um, and it's not more efficient to just make the bet in traditional capital markets. Now, um, one of the things that has been very, very tough for crypto that has made it um, cyclical and exciting is that the oracle problem is very easy to solve if the real world outcome you're betting on is the price of ETH or the price of Bitcoin or something like that. Like you can you can solve that one really easily. So you can build a smart contract that either provides liquidity or that offers a margin loan pretty easily. But building a similar smart contract that offers someone growth capital for their business, you have to also solve the, the problem of how do you know what this business is doing and how do you know when they have paid or whether or not they've defaulted. And I think you could... You could do something. You could do some interesting things with that. Like if you um, if you tried to build an oracle system that is basically plugging into QuickBooks and and is making working offering working capital loans, maybe USDC denominated, based on the dollar flows into and out of someone's business, that could get interesting. You do have to work on the assumption that they're they're QuickBooks. They're, they're keeping accurate books. So you're back to treating the legal system as your your backup oracle. Until there are reliable oracles for everything, crypto is just intrinsically limited in what assets it can touch compared to the the real financial system. Where, like you know, in, in futures, your your oracle is that they can be physically delivered. So um, you 
you know, if you, if you, um, except like if you bought this particular contract, you will get this number of pork bellies delivered to some location um, at some specific time. Um, that's, that's a pretty, pretty effective, um, pretty effective way to kind of ratify the real world, the connection between the financial debt you made and the real world. And um, crypto, crypto does not fix this yet, but it's conceivable that it could. And I think building Building system where you actually you build the the complicated esoteric derivative in crypto and then the implementation of the hedge is partly in fiat could be an interesting way to to connect those. But um, yeah, the replacement like you you can't just replace the financial system. You also have to replace the the superstructure it relies on, and that actually gets even deeper because it's not just the legal system. It's also the set of social norms, and those norms vary from market to market. So, you know, in like the the shorthand is like you can lie when you're trading bonds, you can't lie when you're trading equities, and um, your your ability to lie when trading bonds has been slowly constrained by various legal precedents over time. Um, and crypto would need to rebuild that, but if you allow pseudonymous or anonymous participants, then you can't actually have sustainable social norms in the same way. You can. You you basically you could have um you could have norms on what people must do, but you can't have norms on what they can't do because someone can always spin up a new identity, do the bad thing, and disappear. And then um uh, then we're back to our oracle problem again, because some, sometimes they do that, they do it pseudonymously, um, their legal name gets identified, and then the United States gets to arrest them for market manipulation. You're glossing over a lot there. I think we want to pause because you're touching on several concepts that are critical to actually thinking about. Uh, about crypto. So one is what you highlighted as the Oracle problem, which um, I think it's funny, you made you made the analogy to pork belly futures, which, which I think is the right one. For those who don't know, when, when you trade pork belly futures or, or introduce or coffee or oil, like not all of them, some of them are actually cash delivery, but some of them are actually physical delivery. So for a while, in like the late aughts, I think it was either Morgan or one of the other big banks leased like every damn oil tank in New Jersey. Like every, you'd look out from the office and it was like Morgan who owned all of them. And for some reason, I, I guess the... Yeah, the oil futures curve must have steepened like crazy because they were buying short and selling long. And so there were literally, and there's what's called the convenience yield, which is like the cost per gallon or barrel, whatever the hell it is, to actually store oil, which must be non-trivial. And so they were actually like doing the fucking trade. They were like buying the oil and just like holding it in New Jersey and then selling it long and then eating the difference. And that's the couple between that's the coupling between what is as virtual as any crypto derivative, right? Like these guys talking on phones or something papered over to the reality of the world. That's the problem with crypto, right? And it, like, if I were to cite an analogy, people often joke that like string theory is like this piece of like 20th sec, 22nd century physics dropped into the 20th century, where we actually don't have the technology to actually test some of the theories. I think crypto is like one of these pieces of like 20, 22nd century, like economics that got dropped into our century in like a fully virtualized post singularity world where virtual ownership is all that matters. There is no Oracle problem. The Oracle problem is how do you put a fucking mortgage on chain? Like what connects the fucking house, the thing that I'm in with the thing on chain, unless the men with guns show up and say, yes, that blockchain transaction is this home, then it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant, right? And the way blockchain solves it is saying, well, code is law, right? Whatever the code does is law. That is the men with guns. It's not men with guns. It's computers who say, you suddenly don't own that million dollars of ETH anymore. Sorry, fuck you. The problem is if there's a hack, many hacks are actually the code doing what it's written to do. It's just not kind of what everyone had in their heads when the code ran. And then the question is, well, was it actually illegal? If the smart contract gave you the money and code is law, then definitionally that is what the law prescribes. And yet somehow that's not quite how people think about it. The, the other thing you mentioned that I think is also super important is uh, composability. And the idea there is that these smart contracts, these pieces of logic that live on chain in this global computer called the Ethereum sort of virtual machine can be used like Lego blocks to actually construct other more interesting pieces of logic, right? And so, for example, you have the case, another Spindle client, not that we're talking, I'm like Amja talking about Replit now, except it's me and Spindle. There's a, there's a Spindle client, called, well, it doesn't matter who they are. It's an options protocol and you can buy and sell, you know, options on ETH. And there's like another application that channels trading flow through them that actually has the users. And so like, they just took these, you know, this options protocol smart contract said, okay, now we're going to trade, uh, you know, long, short, like call, calls and puts in Ethereum. They've got this other slick app. The protocol is fine with it because the volume goes through them. And then it, it all, and then like literally they may never have met or even talked and it just all works. That's composability. 
Yeah, and it's 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 very powerful. Um, it does exist in plenty of other contexts too. Like, um, you know, a lot of a lot of modern software companies are this um, this composition of a bunch of other software companies' products. Like, you're you're running things on AWS, and you are talking to your customers on Zoom, and you're coordinating things internally on Slack. Um, so you're you're already doing some level of of composition. Um, it is more seamless in crypto where you can, you, like everything is self-serve. Um, on the other hand, maybe maybe there is um, some utility in actually having a person you can talk to and a person you can yell at. And um, like it's it's especially helpful for, for code is law situations where you just, you did something really stupid and you put in the wrong number and, um, you know, you accidentally ordered a hundred licenses instead of 10 licenses. Like that is something that a, a salesperson will generally not hold you to forever. If you're, if your 10 person company accidentally ordered uh, stuff for a hundred people. But um, if you're, if you're doing that with a crypto profile, crypto protocol, then you don't have that out. There, there's always a learning curve to integrating these products. And um, if you look at the, the employee base for a lot of SaaS companies, like a lot of the people who work there are either, a integrating the product with the specific customer, like helping them actually get it set up, get it up and running, or they're building integrations between their product and something something else. Um, there was that Hacker News thread, which was actually pretty um, pre- had a, a fair amount of foresight to it. Um, in I think late 2021, asking why does DocuSign have so many thousands of employees? Um, what are they for? And one of the answers was just DocuSign has to work with every other SaaS company. And there are a lot of them. And they really, they don't want to lose share to someone who has a tighter integration with the, like if DocuSign only integrates with the five most popular internal chat products and someone else integrates with the top 10, maybe that company starts taking share and they're light network effects. So you actually care about that stuff. There is like this sort of K nearest neighbor growth strategy where the integrations you do determine who your best customers are, and that determines what the next best integration is to do. So that's part of why you can have multiple products that do the same thing and just serve different customer bases, at least at least for a while before they start to specialize even more. Um, if crypto crypto fixes some of this by making the composition a lot easier, making the integration a lot easier. On the other hand, it also means that everyone who actually uses these has to be more technical. And then if you say, well, we're going to solve that by um, having these slick, well-designed user-facing products that then interface with the protocol on the back end, then you're you're rebuilding a lot of the SaaS ecosystem, but um, you do have weaker potentially weaker network effects maybe maybe eventually they're stronger like i think you know over the really long term the way to bet is you bet on whichever product category is going to be more agile more adaptable and um will have have less technical debt over time so in that sense you want to bet on crypto you want to say that over time um there's like some some nth order compounding that happens faster in crypto than it does elsewhere and it eventually is the only thing that matters but um, we don't know when that eventually is, and if there's, if other products, if you know the non-crypto instantiation of something that you could do better in crypto, if it reaches dominant market share before your crypto thing gets off the ground, then it's it's really tough to replace it. I, I think a couple couple things I just wanted to add. So your point on credit, the the thing that I always like to bring up with with crypto people, and I'm you know a crypto person, but in terms of the hardcore people, are like we need to exit the fiat system. The single most successful thing that crypto has actually had from a use case standpoint, if you just look at total dollars generated, like actual, like real value that people can go exchange for goods and services in the real world, whether that's Bitcoin or dollars, is every exchange that has had leverage, right? So if you just look at the history of every exchange outside the US, because it's, it's extremely difficult to do that. And, and, you know, even Coinbase has never effectively been able to offer any amount of leverage legally. But if you just look at the history of all the biggest exchanges, they're all leverage oriented lending credit based markets with the probably the most successful outside of Binance uh, for a period of time was BitMEX, which going back to your point of exotic exotic derivatives, when I when I was running the institutional business for the last six months, I was at Coinbase, I went and met with all the prop shop traders in Chicago who they didn't care that crypto was this weird new thing as long as they could trade a market in it, they, 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 were, they were fine to trade it, right. And, and what was always interesting is the, the prop shops tend to be personal balance sheet. So it's not like some weird compliance person in, in at Goldman telling you, you can't do this. It's, you know, it's like, 
the guy's named Bill. He runs Jump Trading. He's wearing a you know polo shirt across the table for him, worth several billion dollars. And he's talking about the nuances of the BitMEX perp swap, which if you actually you know dig into this stuff, the the perpetual swap of the 100x leverage, something that traditional finance doesn't necessarily have. And so to your point, like crypto is actually now starting to speed run where there are new types of derivatives and new new financial creations because it's completely permissionless. And so you get the the, the skeptic or the negative person being like, well, that's stupid. We, we shouldn't have that. But if you just have any amount of financial history, it's like, you know, now focusing on the extent of money. Every new financial product is rife with kind of a whole bunch of abuse at the beginning and that it takes time over time to your point about banking crises. Uh, you, you get a little bit better at regulating it and, and kind of like it's it's like the wild dog that gets domesticated into the like toy poodle, right? Like it just slowly over time, like turns into the product that works within social norms of society. And so to the last point with Antonio, I, I actually think it's, it's crypto is a thing that as we spend more time digitally, and like, you don't need the meat space Oracle, it's, it's naturally going to be the tool people pick off the shelf. Because it's like, what, what do you care about a Delaware C Corp? If, if like you basically are living in a world now, let's not assume that we're all living in Meta's version of a terms of service like uh, Metaverse, but but like you're spending 95% of your time in some kind of digitally enhanced world, like you're going to kind of want the thing that like has the the most solid footing as it relates to the digital world, not because there's some guy with guns who's going to come and come and uh, enforce it. In, in the digital world, because I, my, my sense is that no one's going to want to go spend time in a corporate world like the Matrix, where you can just have agents of Facebook show up and ruin whatever experience you're going to do. You're going to end up using some third party thing, which turns out that's probably something related to crypto, right? It's like a credible new third party with some set of property rights, right? And so I, I think like the digitally native use cases are always going to be the thing that crypto is going to, to move towards. And you're going to always have these people who are like, how can we get the mortgage on chain? And the reality is, it's like, to your point, like we we've got several hundred years of of common law that have been compressed into this like really efficient instrument and a multi trillion dollar asset class. So I, I think like digitally native uh, uses of crypto for me are always the area to pay the most attention to. But I could, could be wrong. Yeah, no, I mean that, that's how I look at it. It's a financial system for the the digital first world. And I think if you're trying to tie physical mortgages to it, it's kind of a mistake. I mean, nothing against those people. Like maybe it works, but I think it's wrong. So you'll get a, a mortgage on your metaverse house. In crypt, like you'll get a BTC denominated metaverse mortgage. That's uh, <laughs> that's gonna be fun. When you said about the, the, the DocuSign thing, why do they have so many people like connecting so many fast businesses? Again, I'm 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 I'm, I'm John Maxing in terms of self plugging the company, but like part of how I led to this whole spindle thing was like, do you realize the amount of like rate? It's funny people always bitch about like all the fucking cycles and carbon footprint of like crypto. Do you realize how much like the carbon footprint of like the digital media world of like literally loading every browser in like. 40 different calls going out to 40 different other servers, syncing the, what you're doing on that, like on that property with the other property. There's literally billions and billions of events that all it is saying is, oh, Antonio bought this thing and came from this thing and this other thing, by the way, reconcile all the records. Like that is the nature of how all of Web2 ad tech works. And it's like, the fucker, how about you just all write it to the same database? How about you just do that? But like everyone just writes to one and we all read from that one and that's the end of it. And that would actually be way more efficient, right? Funny, it reminds me, this, this week I had a semi-viral tweet I was joking. I was talking to a, a DJ and actually his employee. And we were working with a marketing firm that's kind of old school. And they had Tableau. Tableau is like a BI analytics tool that basically lets you turn a SQL query on proprietary data into this thing you can read. And I was trying to explain what Tableau was. And I said, oh, you know, it's like doing analytics, but for the off-chain world. And then he instantly got it's like, oh, I see. So if like you have a separate database that nobody writes to, for some reason you put it there. And you have to read from it. That's the way you turn like a query into a readable thing. Oh, I get it now. Right. But you could tell like his mind was like, no, the database should be held in common. Why would you have your own data? Like who the fuck wants their own database? Yeah. Obviously, blockchain is not the solution to every data problem. It's, there's often very good reasons to have separate databases, but it's just it's often just a very different way of looking at the world. And the reality is that in many cases, actually the common database would work best as, as the technical solution. So. Every time I see a hack in crypto. I just think of like, um, so you, you said the 17th century Dutch jurist, right? Like thinking about like, okay, how do we do insurance for ships? Like the, you know, the common ownership percentages, all, all that stuff gets like figured out on the fly. And it's like every voyage to go get, by the way, pepper, right? Nothing like actually serious about it. This is like completely fashionable. It's like, ooh, this makes this thing taste better. Let's create joint stock corporations and like an entire economic system based on going to get pepper. I'm in defense of Pepper, just one thing. The I know very little Dutch, or I know zero Dutch, but one of the most amusing 
Dutch phrases right now. You know what it is? Pepper dur, pepper expensive. They still use pepper as the example of something expensive. But to say something is pepper is expensive, it's saying it's as expensive as pepper. And it's still like common parlance in the Netherlands, which it's weird. But anyhow, sorry to interrupt. But pepper is serious business, Dan. It's just like you have midwits who are like, oh, Dutch tulip bubble. It's just like, no, that's, that's a result of basically all the wealth that got created. It was effectively their version of whatever you want to call it, like NFTs or any mean stock where it's like, oh, we just have all this excess capital. Like, let's let's have this thing go. Uh, but but the, the reality of the economic system was based on exploitation of, of other countries around the world to get pepper and, and then expanding from there. But but like when you see a hack, like there was one this week, I think it was an Euler Finance or something like that. And it's like a big hack. Each time that's happening, there's, to your point, it's like a bug bounty. It's like, oh, wow, that's really expensive. And, and so the quality of these on-chain kind of, um, you know, immutable for the most part, I mean, you can have upgradable contracts, but like the, the core mechanisms for the stuff that exists on chain, they get slowly better. And that's to me no different than what what a Delaware C Corp is, is just like a, a long lineage of, you know, Dutch Dutch traders in in Amsterdam figuring out how to insure and, and properly compensate the the proceeds coming off of pepper ships to to kind of like what you get with Stripe Atlas out of the box today and up until last week at SVB bank account. But like the the like that lineage took several hundred years. And I think what crypto is doing is it's kind of compressing that cycle time into like internet time. And so, yeah, it's going to keep not working, not working, not working until like it actually starts to work. And I think if the other bet you want to make is if we just spend more time digitally, then the people building that world aren't going to go pick the meat space framework. They're going to pick the thing that can actually be enforced 100% digitally. Yeah, I think another piece of the like the idea of crypto speed running the rest of financial history is... I guess it raises the question of how close we are to the end of financial history. Like if we've, if the current financial system has like the fiat system has actually figured everything out, then crypto is kind of a waste of time. Like it's just going to relearn all those lessons and then get to what the current system is. But if crypto actually does have that faster cycle time, then maybe um, crypto does actually get ahead of the fiat system and stay ahead. And if, if that's true, then, um, then crypto does actually have a meaningful competitive advantage in doing a lot of finance things. But then it's actually kind of hard to hard to talk about what those would be, because if you knew what they were, then you'd be able to do them in fiat and just have a larger customer base right away. And you'd already be your regulatory story would be a lot easier. So um, it ends up being kind of a vague thesis, but really it is tied to um, one, the question of how how solvable is finance um, to the question of how close are we to solving it? And through the question of um, is there some kind of systemic flaw in crypto that keeps it from ever reaching the fiat level, or does it actually potentially go past it? Because I think everyone agrees that, like even crypto critics will agree, things happen faster in crypto. It would be very hard for the entire FTX story to have happened in the fiat world. And actually, um, FTX-ish stories do happen in in the fiat world, but they often happen at a slow enough pace that. Um, sometimes there's just not enough time for a crisis. Like this is one of my first reactions when, when CoinDesk first wrote the story on how um, Alameda owned a huge chunk of FTT. I was like, well, this this looks really weird. It looks, you know, it looks like an Ouroboros where the collateral is coming from the exchange and the liquidity is coming from levering that collateral. On the other hand, the New York Stock Exchange was entirely owned by the the specialist who traded on that exchange. And um, I actually tried to find examples of this. I wasn't able to find a specific example of someone borrowing against their New York Stock Exchange seat in order to have the capital to trade. But I know that people borrowed to get a seat on an exchange and then traded with borrowed money. So in that case, the it was once again, it was basically an exchange token as collateral for providing liquidity on that exchange. So it was the the initial version of the FTX story before the the actual scam part came in um, that that had a, that did actually have fiat history precedents, and um, they were they were not disaster stories. They were just like weird quirks of how the system was organized stories. Remind me who is the who is the guy in Asia who who had that big blow up uh, eighteen months ago or something? Oh, oh, Archegos, yeah, yeah. So, but but wasn't he basically doing a thing where he was telling the different banks that he was he was like he didn't have as much leverage from the other ones, and so he was basically going out and getting a bunch of leverage with a minimal amount of collateral. 
People thought so, but um, apparently in Credit Credit Suisse's report on that, they actually said that they knew how much leverage he had. They were just giving him an insane amount of leverage. Um, Like the story didn't actually, it didn't actually make sense to me and to to anyone I knew that he was actually getting that much leverage that everyone knew how much he was borrowing elsewhere. But apparently they all knew. Um, They just, they underestimated how, how illiquid those stocks would be if he wasn't constantly buying them. So in some ways, it's like, you know, people can use that when what was it, you could use uh, the three arrows capital from last year as an example of like, they were kind of doing a bunch of this stuff. But, but if everyone knew, then it's like, how, how is that system any any like better in the sense that like, they just they were doing it, and they got some, you know, quote, compliance and regulatory sign off, because ultimately, if it goes high up enough of a bank, they're going to come up with the reason why it's compliant. Yeah, like my, you know, one of my reactions to the Archigo story was, okay, this is, uh, you know, clearly a disaster. Can't believe this happened. And my other reaction was like, wait, I can get, if I'm big enough, I could actually get eight to one leverage running a concentrated equities portfolio. Um, yeah, that, that actually sounds kind of appealing. Maybe, maybe I should change my plans a little bit. Just, just get big enough. Yeah. Yeah. You know, every time there is a disaster like that, like sometimes you look back and you're like, well, this person was extremely clever and slightly too risk tolerant. And if they had been equally clever, even not quite as clever, and just a little bit more patient than they would have made a ton of money. It's actually an example of that from from commodities trading, where I think, I think it's the only it's the only case I know of where there was a company where the founder ended up on the Forbes 400 list, and then the successor CEO ended up actually making more money than the founder, just from having worked at that company and working his way up to CEO, which is um, the former Mark Rich and Co, where Mark Rich was on the Forbes 400. Um, And uh, Forbes actually used to put his source of wealth as commodities trading and tax evasion. And then um, the successor to that company, the CEO of that company is worth like $10 billion. And Rich was never worth $10 billion. And it was because Mark Rich was extremely good at commodities trading and um, extremely willing to risk prison time for uh, in order to make a trade and in order to defer or avoid paying his taxes on it. And if you had the same infrastructure, worked in the same business, and were almost as good a trader, but also bet a smaller fraction of your your dollar bankroll, as well as your um, freedom from jail time bankroll, then you you got to compound for a lot longer without spending much time in court, and so um, came out ahead. Yeah, you have to cite the example that he got a pardon from Clinton at the end, so he didn't actually do time for his crimes. He did have to stay in Switzerland. Apparently, there was a period where he... Uh, oh, the horrors. Every... Every every weekend he would have a he would have his private plane fly to New York and pick up sandwiches from his favorite deli and fly them back to Switzerland. So it, you know it must have been hard. Um, now that we've uh, come across really important topics, we're we're, we're at time here. Uh, Burn, is there any uh, any any last thought, uh, wrap up thought you wanna you wanna have have here or anything you uh, wanted to say that we didn't quite get to? Uh, no, I think this is this has been a really interesting situation. Um, financial, like I, I mentioned, the question of like does finance get solved, and you know, the answer is it it never gets solved. And um, it, usually, the biggest blowups happen from the places where it does look solved, because um, you know, anytime very low risk rounds down to no risk, then risk just starts growing and doesn't stop until there's a blow up. So this kind of thing will will always happen um this specific thing probably won't happen very many more times but um yeah it's uh it always leads to it leads to, it always uh teaches you something i, I think that's a great place to, to wrap uh burn thank you so much for joining us on moment of zen anytime great having you burn great having you moment of zen is brought to you by riverside the platform dan antonio and i use to record all of our podcast episodes with remote guests Riverside captures exceptional audio and video quality, makes it incredibly easy for us to record conversations with multiple guests and then edit and publish within minutes. If you're hosting a podcast or often getting interviewed, use our code ZEN to get a 20% discount at Riverside FM. The link is in our description box. SecureFrame is the leading all-in-one platform for security and privacy compliance. SecureFrame helps you get SOC 2 audit ready in weeks, not months, and it's used by thousands of companies like AngelList, Coda, and Remote. I believe in the company so much I invested in it, and I recommend it to all my portfolio companies. Sign up for a free demo at secureframe.com and mention Moment of Zen during your demo to get 20% off your first year of SecureFrame.